Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our five o'clock message from the Word of God here at the Keller Church of Christ. I'm Corey Collins, and as you're watching online, we hope you'll make a comment that you'll reach out, let us know that you are on. We are excited to have this time to talk about the fact that God can change our lives, that we may feel like we're going around in circles, we're not making any progress, we're not getting to where we need to be. With all the things we try and the frustration we feel when things don't improve the way we want them to, we may wonder sometimes, are we always going to be where we are? How can God, through his word and his spirit, and through some steps we can take, work in our lives to make us more what he wants us to be and also what we want to be? And that's a real key in this lesson. So open your Bible with me to Ephesians 4. Verse 17 will be there in a few moments. We had a wonderful Bible class this morning here and also worship assembly. We've just reopened several of our classes for adults and all ages of children. These meet every Sunday morning now at nine o'clock. And so if you are comfortable and would like to come and be in those studies, we would be so pleased to have you here in person. And then our 10 o'clock service has been in person for some time, but Again, we continue to stream and offer uh, these uh, presentations on Facebook Live and on Zoom. But we'd love to hear from you if you are looking for a closer walk with the Lord, if you have some burden you're carrying, if your situation right now is very tense and you're anxious and uncertain, please get in touch. Let's pray with you. Let's reach out to you. Let's talk about what the Lord can do in your life. And really, that's the gist of this lesson today. We're going to talk about two interactive processes that must be in place and working together in order for change to come. We're going to call it inside out and outside in. Sometimes we wonder, you know, how do things get beyond where they are now? Do we start on the inside and we're so driven and so moved and so on fire that the external things sort of work themselves out? Or is it the other way? We see on the outside where we need to be, what we believe we should be doing. And so we start with that and then we kind of move backwards to the inside. I like visual aids. And I found this one. I thought you might enjoy it too, like I do. Look at this train and note the title that says you can change the direction just by thinking about it. Now give it a couple of minutes. As I'm looking at the train right now, it seems to be going away from me into the darkness. But if I continue to look at different parts of it, before long, I can, now it's going the other way. It's the very same image, but depending on the way that I, I don't know, uh, think about it, uh, look at it, focus on it, it's coming toward me now. And now let's see if I can Look at it a little bit longer and see if I can get it. Now it's going away from me again. How about you? How about dropping me a comment and let me know if you're able to change the direction of the chain of the train? Well, this is what this message is about. Actually, this is the third in something of a series. The first we call tipping point, and it was built on the idea that many things happen in life incrementally. And if we will make small changes, even 1%, 2%, 3% changes, and let these build up over time, then gradually the result will be, uh, it will lead to a turn. And the turn won't be because of that last moment or inch, but it'll be the result of all the inches that led up to it, sort of reinforcing and accumulating. Uh, and so the second thing we talked about was all systems go, that while we're in the process sometimes of setting goals, so often if we will look at systems, at the way we do things and how uh, they work together in a cohesive uh, unit, then that which needs to happen will often result because of that. So now we're going to talk about this third idea which has to do with the inside and the outside and how they work together with each other. I hope you were able to change the direction of that train. 
Why is it so hard for us to change? You know, we decide that starting tomorrow, we're going to do this differently. We will stop that. And we're just determined and maybe we're excited and maybe we put it on the calendar. It could be a new year or a new opportunity. You know, we start a job and it's going to be different from the way we approach the last one. And we have a lot of gusto and a lot of enthusiasm. And then after not too long, we find ourselves falling back where we were again. Maybe we're going to stop a habit. Maybe we're going to make better use of our time. Maybe we're going to cut out the television or the internet to a large extent, or we're going to do some additional things with our children or improve our marriage. And, and yet we find uh, it's, it's just so difficult. Why is that? Well, I thought of several reasons as we get started. One is, as we say, we're creatures of habit. We get stuck in our old ruts and ways. And sometimes we use that as an excuse. No one's perfect. This is just the way I am. And the more we get accustomed to a cycle, even when it's not effective, the more we tend to think this is normal. And so we should accept it and adjust to it. And everyone else around us needs to change because, hey, this is just the way I am. We may be relying on our own strength. You know, scripture talks about the armor of God in Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, shield of faith, and so forth. Maybe we're trying to pull ourselves up instead of devoting ourselves to uh, penitence and perhaps fasting and devotion to spiritual things. We may see ourselves where we are and not where we can be. And our horizon can be very low. Uh, we don't really raise ourselves as we talked this morning from John chapter four, lift up your eyes. Well, we've always been looking at things this way, though God sees us as to where we can be. Well, our past failures, why would we just keep on? It's so irritating, it's so hard. You know, here I go again, Try, I've tried that 20 times and uh, I'm really no, no farther along than I was. We take the la a a path of least resistance. Someone said path of least persistence. I like that too. It's just easier to go with the flow, to let things kind of glide, kind of slide. And, uh, you know, persistence is a hard thing because it takes steadfast pushing and moving and consistency. Sometimes we look for a quick fix, a magic pill, maybe a self-help solution that, hey, just do this and this and this, and your life is going to be turned around. We may be trying to change the wrong thing or change things in the wrong order. And that's really what I want to talk about with you this evening. What needs to change in order for our behavior to be different from what it's been. Some time back, Tanya and I were watching a commercial on television and it was talking about something in your car that cleans what goes through your air conditioner and comes into the area where you're sitting. It's called a cabin air filter. Well, many people are aware that your engine has an air filter, but this is a second item. And so that you'll have clean and fresh cool air on a hot summer day, you have this cabin air filter. And so we began to think, you know, we have a car that's a 2005 Mercury Sable. And to our knowledge, we had never done anything with the cabin air filter. And so we decided we would find out what it was, what it looked like, and, and maybe see if it might need replacing. Well, here's a look, if I can put this up here for you to see. Some of it's going to fall out as I'm talking with you because it was so cluttered. It was so dark and dirty and nasty. Our mechanic said it had certainly never been changed. This is the original equipment. So, you know, each of these little leaves goes back to some <laughs> experience, some trip, something going on in the past. And now it's just collected and collected and collected. Well, so now we have a replacement. And because of that, uh, we're going to have healthier air. And somebody said, you know, we're talking about masks. We're going to be sure we don't breathe in anything that 
might contain the virus or contaminate us or make us sick. And yet we drive around in our cars with these cabin air filters that may be way dirty. Now, please don't pause this video to go check your cabin air filter. But keep in mind that life is like that, out of sight, out of mind. We keep breathing in the same ideas, the same thoughts, the same perspective. We go around and around and around. And sometimes we don't really stop to check the filter and to see how this stuff got into our life and how God could work through our obedient faith to purify us and to get us on the right track where we're taking in his word and we're walking with his spirit, we're trusting in him and we're becoming more and more like Christ. So why is it so hard to change? One reason may be that we have that filter and we need to look at some things we haven't looked at before. And that's really what we want to do in this message tonight. Well, as we think about change that God can bring, it's obviously the case that Jesus, when he touched people, he met people, he taught people, they became transformed. They went from what they were to what he could cause them to be. Let's start with a couple of examples of this. As you know, Mark 1, 16 and 17, here were men that were fishing for fish. That's what fishermen do. And Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus didn't simply say, you will fish for men. Here's your job. Here's your duty. Here's what has to be different about your behavior. Instead, he said, I'm going to make you something you have not been before. It's an identity change in the way you see yourself. So instead of uh, Simon and Andrew saying to each other, I can't fish for men. Now, I am a fisher of men because Jesus Christ is making me into a person of this character, this quality, this perspective, so that the activity flows out of it. Well, here's another common example. Jesus talking to Simon, the son of John, bar Jonah, after Simon Peter had made the confession, you're the Christ. His name was Simon, likely. He was named after Simeon, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, one of the tribes. But now Jesus renames him Peter. And we're often quick to say that the church is not built on Peter. It's a play on words. Peter has confessed Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's on that bedrock that our faith and our hope and the Lord's church are, are set. But it is the fact that Jesus is saying, in effect, I'm going to make you into a rock. And you know that Peter was impulsive. He was rash. He would speak first and think later. And yet on Pentecost, there you have him. And in the house of Cornelius in Acts 10. And what Jesus named him changed his self-image. And so the result was, he's this great apostle and preacher. We know from 1 Peter 5, he's an elder, and we admire him and other heroes of Scripture. Think about the apostle Paul. The Lord named him an apostle. And he says, I'm not worthy. I'm not fit. I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul, what are you? I am an apostle. An apostle means one who is sent by God. Well, what were you? I was a persecutor. I was a blasphemer. Look in 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. A violent aggressor. Think of all the disturbances. He wreaked havoc. We read in Acts chapter 8 and Acts 9, he held the garments of those that stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But now I am an apostle. 
in Galatians chapter 1, if you were to look over there, those who heard of his conversion said he is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. So why is he the different person now from what he was? It's not just a name, but with that name, Apostle is a new way of thinking of himself what he is, what he wants to be, what the Lord has called him to be. You know, all the way through the Bible, you can see names that steer a person into a specific direction. For example, in Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 6, a son is born and his parents name him Nuach in Hebrew. We say Noah. Noah means rest. And they said, because maybe God will use him to bring us rest from the curse that's on the ground as a result of sin. So from the time Noah was born, his mother and father told him, this is who you are. This is our hope. This is the fulfillment of God's promise. And they couldn't have known, nor could he, that he would build that boat and save his family from the flood and that the result would be he would be an heir of the righteousness that's by faith. Hebrews 11, he was moved by godly fear, that passage says, and in reverence, he prepared the ark for the saving of his household. The Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. When did that start? Well, this is the reason that when a child is young and we tell that child God is going to work in your life. You will be a faithful servant, perhaps a leader, a, an elder, a preacher, a deacon, a teacher, a soul winner. This is what you can be. And we instill that early in that little one. Think of how many have arisen from such roots to become effective in the Lord's cause. On the other hand, when parents tell their children, you're a brat, you'll never amount to anything. Your life is not going to be of any good. You're lazy, you're weak, you're not smart, and so forth. That forms in that boy or girl an identity. And so the behavior tends to reflect the way that child has been taught to think about himself or herself. So. What we're talking about is how much the Bible has to say about who you are, this inside out, as well as the outside in. And the Bible talks about both. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But Jesus changes lives. We said a moment ago that maybe we're trying to change the wrong thing. James Clear, in his book, Atomic Habits, that I've mentioned before during this series, talks about an onion and the layers or levels of behavioral change. And I think what he says fits so well with what we've seen in the scripture. He says, we seek sometimes results. We want to shed a few pounds. We want to earn more money. We want to quote parts of the Bible. We want to teach a class. We want to be regular in worship. And we have this outcome we want. And this is where we have our goals. And it's what we get, what we're after. It's what we hope we can achieve or accomplish. Once we have the outcome we want, most often we adopt strategies, habits, systems, mechanisms. Okay, I'm going to change this, so I will do this. For example, someone may say, I want to stop using profanity or stop viewing uh, pornography or stop spending so much time in this or that. That's the outcome. So what process is, well, I'm getting my calendar. I'm gonna get my smartphone. I'm gonna get my clock. I may get some people to remind me and partner with me. 
And, and through this process, I'm going to reach the outcome. But it starts with the outcome and then the process. Ultimately, then, that will affect my identity. The outward things I do can change my traits, my characteristics. I may become more morally pure or self-controlled or godly or knowledgeable in the word of God. This identity has to do with my values, what I believe, what I accept is true. Sometimes we call it my world view. And these things are all involved in change. And it's not that one of them is to change and not the other. But the question is, what order do we go? Frequently, people start with outcomes. And then they develop the process, but it may not ever transform how they see themselves as to who they are and what their lives are about. And so once the pressure is off or the outcome is reached, they go back to wasting money. They go back to gaining weight. They go back to being lazy, being late for work. They go back to what they were doing before because it was externally driven. Think about this though. What if you started with identity? We're going to see this exactly what happens in Ephesians 4, 17 and following, and really all through the word of God. And starting with the fact, okay, Simon, you're now a rock. Oh, I'm a rock. Okay. Uh, that's my identity. What are the processes that, that I would be involved in because I've been given this calling and then the outcome certainly in a way still worth pursuing. It doesn't necessarily take care of itself, but often it will. And this is internally driven. This becomes a desire, something that is thrilling and attractive that you and I are eager to continue. And so it stays with us and our lives change. So, the question we may often ask, what do you want to achieve? What if we change that to who do you think you are? And who do you wish to become? Oh my, if you really get sold on who you wish to become, and let's change that, who you believe God would have you to become. We're not talking about some kind of self-centered, ego-driven, I want to get this or accomplish this, but but my relationship with God, the character that he can develop through my faith. Okay, now let's look at Ephesians 4. And I put a stopping point at verse 24, but we could certainly continue farther than that. In Paul's letters, he typically uses the first part, often the first half, to talk about doctrine, what we call the indicative. This is the truth. These are the facts. This is what God has said. And then the second part of each letter is the so what. Here's the ethics. Here's what different, here's the what, what's going to happen in your life because you've accepted the doctrine and built your life on it. Now, in Ephesians 4, verse 17, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now, when Paul uses the word Gentiles by inspiration, he's talking not just about those that are physically non-Jews, but live apart from the will of God. He's telling us that those who choose that identity express it in the way they think and walk and speak and act. Look at verse 17. The futility of their mind. Why? Well, the thinking grows out of the fact that they're not connected with God. 
their character, their view of themselves is rooted in their culture, maybe the social mirror, how they think they appear to other people or themselves, their own pleasures and lustful desires. But because of that, ignorance, hardness of heart and callousness. Now look in the middle of verse 18. Why? Why are they this way on the outside? Because they're separate from the life of God. Will they change for the better? Are they likely to become holy and righteous and patient and kind and true and moral? If their identity is apart from God, Gentiles in this sense, they will continue to think in ways that are futile and be hard-hearted and calloused, and they will give themselves to sensuality, which is hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, and the practice of impurity and greediness. Now, what about those of us who've come into Christ? Look at verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way. You've been heard, you've been taught in him. In reference to your former manner of life, verse 22, lay aside the old self. It's corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, as you have opportunity, read the rest of chapter four and also Ephesians 5 and 6, and you will see that everything we are taught to do comes out of this new sense of identity that we have learned Christ, and the truth is in Jesus. So we speak the truth, we lay aside falsehood, we don't let the sun go down on our wrath, we don't let anger lead us to sin, we don't speak unwholesome words. We walk in love. We don't let immorality be named among us. And you can go cover to cover in the Bible and see this very same principle. To me, and I'm sure to you, this is so powerful that if I'm just trying to pack on these outward things, these outcomes, these tasks, uh, these levels I want to achieve, but there's not something that turns around the way I look at myself and who I am, it's not going to last. And so in Ephesians 4 and verse 17 through 24, and again, you could go all the way through the best rest of Ephesians, you realize that any behavior that contradicts your view of your own self will not last. If it's not your core, if it's not who you are, it will only last as long as you are forced to continue it. And you know this, you know how your parents and mine tried to mold us and make us and help us to become those that love to obey, love to do good, and love to serve God. Otherwise, if it's simply forced upon us, once that force is taken away, the child will rebel. On the other hand, if it relates to who you wholeheartedly want to become as a child of God, that becomes an image that you develop and maintain with joy. And so it's not a drudgery. It is an opportunity because it's who you are. Otherwise, any improvements you and I make are going to be temporary. James Clear writes, the more deeply a thought or action is tied to your identity, the more difficult it is to change it. The biggest barrier to positive change at any level, outcomes, processes, or identity, is a conflict. When I'm trying to do something that is at odds with who I am and with what I believe I need to be. So let's notice how often in Scripture Jesus called those and then transform them into becoming what he said they were. What about Judas? Well, Judas never bought into. He never accepted the identity that he was offered. And so it is with you and me as the word of God summons us and invites us to be like him. 
we have the choice as to how we respond. We can put on some outward things. We can go along with the rest of the apostles. We can look the part and say the right things. But Judas all along in himself was never the new person that he was called to be. Oh, we're called to be saints, living stones, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. You're connected to me. And that's the reason you will bear fruit. Oh, in Corinth, there were so many issues and problems and struggles. And so when Paul began 1 Corinthians 1, he said, you're called to be saints. The rest of the book says, now act that way. Don't you love it when Jesus said, I've not called you just my slaves, but my friends, because a slave does not know what his master's doing. And I have told you what is coming. What a thrill it is to be able to say, I am a friend, of Jesus Christ. When that gets into my blood and into my soul, then I will act more and more like a friend of Jesus Christ. And so it is with these other images. I'm a priest. So are you if you're in Christ and so forth. Now, these self-fulfilling identities, these are things that people say, and you can, you can come up with a thousand others. A person will say, I'm terrible with directions. And that's a way of saying, I'm not going to be able to get you from point A to point B because I am not that person. Or, you know, I'm not a morning person. And what does that mean? Well, you'll just have to put up with me. I'm going to be grouchy and grumpy early in the day. That's just, you know, that's just the way I am. Oh, I can't remember people's names. I'm always late, not good at technology. I don't know how to lead anyone to Christ. You know, as long as I tell myself that, that's who I think I am, of course I'm not going to talk about Jesus to the people I know. I'm, I'm not a reader, someone may say. Read through the Bible, I am not a reader. See how the identity, I am not a Bible reader, translates into, I didn't finish what I started in God's book, because the identity is not uh, fitting for that particular behavior or such and such is not my talent. Well, is that some, I mean, there are things we have that are varying levels of talents, but if that's an excuse that keeps me from changing God's way, it's going to keep me in this rut, going in this cycle in these old habits and ways. So what if we change it to this? <laughs> I am a child of the King. I'm filled with the spirit of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know what he says next? I worked harder than any of them. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Why did he work harder? Because by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love the word of God. Of course, I read and study and take notes and outline. Why? Because this is who I am. And I'm speaking not just for me, but for, for each of you. I'm a soul winner. Instead of saying, I can't bring anyone to Jesus. I am a soul winner. I am becoming what God has called me to be. And it's an adventure. And it is the joy of my life. I care for my body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. You see how that's different from saying, I can't quit such and such that affects my body, that hurts my health. Hey, my body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. That view affects my morality, what I'm willing to put into my system, and so forth. I'm going to heaven. I'm taking others with me. I delight in communing with God in worship and prayer. Do you see how that's quite different from saying, you really ought to go to church all the time. You ought to attend every Bible class. You ought to be present every time the doors are open. See, that starts with outcome and then processes but if it doesn't come from the identity, then once the pressure is off, the behavior will stop. Inside out, outside in. It's reciprocal because of who we choose to be in the image of God. We delight in practicing the outward things that are part of that. As we practice those outward things, they 
build up even further the sense of identity that we have. And so we experience victory and success and progress in our relationship to God. We're so glad you have joined us this evening for our sermon at five o'clock from the Keller Church of Christ. Once again, I'm Corey Collins, and we are so glad that you were with us. If you did not leave a comment, would you take a moment right now and say hello, tell us that you're watching. If you have a question or you'd like us to address something in a future presentation, we'd be so glad to hear from you. So until we talk with you again, God bless you, and may he work with you and me inside out and outside in. God bless you.